First, um, I want to uh, announce that you know we have the um, midterm set up for uh, that Monday, the 5th of October. One of the reasons that is set up that day is that I'm going to be having hip total hip replacement on Monday, the 5th of October. So uh, Professor Steele is going to be um, proctoring the exam. But anyway, uh, and it's the same hip surgeon that did Professor Steele's hips. And so he's running 100 mile races and stuff. And he did my other hip last year. But bottom line is, I am probably, uh, for Parents Weekend, I'm not going to be at the Beerman Center for Parents Weekend. I will, pr I will be in my office uh, just because it's more comfortable there. And, um, and uh, when you have hip replacements, they really worry about infections and that kind of stuff. So, um, but w what that means is if any of your parents have requested me for uh, Parents Weekend, then uh, Kohama Barber is going to send me the information, and then maybe we can set up. I already have one parent that I'm doing a phone call with. Uh, so, in any event, uh, I know if you have, if you you know, been to Parents Weekend, there's lots and lots of parents, and there's there you you know you got ten you have ten minutes, and then you have to be to the other thing and like two minutes or something like that. So, uh, but if you had a break, like if your parents were here and they had a break and they could come over from the Beerman or maybe this is their last one or whatever, we can, we'll try to set that up. But anyway, the bottom line is um, the uh, provost office is going to have me as unavailable, but I will in fact be at the office and, uh, and we can, or I can, like I said, I can, I've already got um, one uh, phone call that I'm going to be doing with one of the one of the students in my 105 class. So, just to uh, uh, give you a, a heads up on that, um, and then you know you might if you want to let your parents know that that's fine. But I will connect with anybody that has applied, uh, you know, for or put in a request for uh, for me. All right. Any questions on that? No? Okay. Um, all right, um, the, uh, um, the band pick of the week this week is uh, Jamestown Revival. Jamestown Revival. Anybody you heard of them? Okay, um, they've been around for a, not too long. They've been around for a bit. They're a duo. Um, from Texas, and their genre is sort of uh, southern rock, um, uh, country. Uh, it's a whole mix of uh, um, a whole a whole mix of southern and uh, Texas type sound. Uh, so anyway, there you might you might want to just try listening to a couple of their tunes to see what it, what they're like. All right. Um, so last time we were in, uh, getting into this idea of uh, the topics and the economics of property law. And um, notice that uh, if some of you had Econ 105. Um, uh, what do we know? We know that, that they, they point out in Berzell and Rosenberg's book, How the West Grew Rich, uh, innovation, right? That's the key to advancement, to economic advancement. And we've talked about how you are the, you're, you know, you're wealthier than the wealthiest person in the world 100 years ago, right? You're wealthier than uh, John D. Rockefeller. Uh, and, and also, you, some of you probably heard of uh, Schumpeter's uh, book in his, uh, uh, called Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, if you've had maybe something from Professor Steele or the like. And what did he call? He, he calls the market system is a system of what? Creative destruction. Right? We want to we wanna have innovation, right? Um, when I went off to, uh, to college, uh, I took a, uh, the 
probably the latest thing that they had was a portable typewriter. Okay. Um, now, I suspect, I mean, it was cool because it wasn't the big black, you could carry it in a little box with you, and et cetera. So I'm guessing none of you uh, brought a portable typewriter uh, when you came uh, to college. Um, maybe you haven't even seen a typewriter. Uh, but anyway, uh, that, you know, what's, what's going on is we have these innovations, and what happens? The Underwood typewriter factories are gone, right? They're destroyed uh, by the economic innovation that's going on by, uh, you know, by advancements. And, and so that was Schumpeter's point, is that we want to have, um, you know, we, we want to have this innovation, but it's, it's creative destruction, right? The, you know, Polaroid cameras. I mean, some things stay around, um, but the, uh, uh, you know, we've still got one of the, uh, you know, vinyl records are, you know, still around. But, uh, but the point is, is that we want to encourage this innovation. That's why we were wealthier. And so what you want to do is set this property rights up um, as a, in a way that encourages innovation. That's why we, why we want to worry about property rights. So one of the, one of the uh, topics in property rights would be, what do you do about information? Right. As some sort of intellectual property. Right? Should you, should, you know, when we were talking earlier on, on what you can own, um, what do you think about it? Information is costly produced, but it's difficult to exclude. Right? Sort of think about that. Um, I got a, I got a, uh, spend millions of dollars, perhaps, uh, in developing a vaccine or something like that, right? Uh, but um, what about information as, as a whole? Once we know how to do something, then it's difficult to exclude people from just copying it, right? And so uh, Information it has characteristics of a, uh, of a public good, if you want to sort of think about it. Remember we talked about information has, has these public good characteristics, and when we talked about public good, we said what? That's non-rival, right? If this is an issue of public good, it's non-rival in consumption, right? It's non-rival in consumption and you all get the same amount, and it's difficult to exclude. Once you know how to do something, it's difficult to keep other people from knowing how to do it as well. Right? Once you've discovered how to fly an airplane or how to make an airplane, uh, it's difficult for people to, it's difficult to exclude people from also now going, oh, I see how this works, and go ahead and do it. Um, and if you sort of think about it, it's like a public good in that it's, it would be not Pareto optimal to preclude people, right? Because it's non-rival consumption. If I know how to, you know, if I know how to uh, write in cursive, um, it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't take away from my ability to do that or my information when you learn how to do it. So information's got these sort of characteristics that are much like a uh, pure public good, uh, and so this uh, non-rivalness in, in, uh, in consumption makes it so it would seem like it wouldn't be Pareto optimal to exclude people. Once we know how the produce the vex, you know, COVID-19 vaccine, well, do you want to, the, the marginal cost of a shot of this COVID-19 vaccine could be extremely small, right? Most of the costs of drugs are the cost of going through the Food and Drug Administration process, the stage one, stage two, stage three trials. Um, and again, if you uh, look at my lecture in, uh, it's, I think it's called Constitution and Economic 
controversy or something like that. Uh, I have a lecture on healthcare where I talk about, uh, you know, do you want to uh, require these uh, stage three, um, uh, ha have it go through the stage three process before it can be allowed? Or could somebody say, hey, I'll, you know, I'm good, I'm, I'm willing to try it, right? So, uh, but, the, but the issue here is that the, the, the marginal cost of another, a little bit of that, the drug, the vaccine, is going to be real small. The cost in getting the vaccine is figuring out how to do it, right? And so, question is, once we know what the vaccine looks like, should we exclude people? Right? I mean, that's, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, what about, but if I'm not going to exclude people, what's my incentive to produce it? Right? I, got, I, I don't have the incentive to produce it. I don't, uh, and so, uh, but how many have ever used Wikipedia? Right? Well, you didn't pay for Wikipedia, did you? No. Wikipedia is free. Now, sometimes they'll send a little thing asking for a donation, right? Um, but bottom line is, we, we are producing information out here, uh, and, and people are just doing it voluntarily. So, um, there, you know, Spotify, right? You can get that for free, but what do they do? They give you ads, right? And, and, and then you can avoid the ads by going and purchasing the, you know, the, the, the Spotify uh, and, and for the premium. And so um, there's all sorts of ways, if you sort of think through it, all sorts of ways that the, the market has found ways to get around this problem of this, you know, this public good problem. Um, but, you know, I talked about uh, uh, I Love Lucy, you know, that you have this private, yeah, this uh, difficult to exclude people from the airways uh, once they've got their antenna up there, but they found, oh, but I can exclude people from advertising, so I found something that was connected that I could then, has some private goodness to it. All right, so what are some of the uh, ways that we might deal with the public good process of information? Okay, so how do you deal with this public good problem. One is you could subsidize it, right? The government could provide National Science Foundation grants. Right? Um, they could, and which in fact they do, right? Um, we say, okay, uh, we understand there's uh, problems with uh, you know uh, intellectual uh, advancement, and so what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to subsidize you to do this. I just put in the um, uh, put in the folder, the 472 folder in this section, um, an article on prizes. That is, the government might, instead of uh, having you send in your National Science Foundation grant application. Uh, and having a bunch of uh, scientists go through them and say, oh yeah, this person's, yeah, this is worth uh, you know, $15 million or whatever. They could just offer a prize. And the government could say, hey, I'm offering a billion dollar prize to the first person that can come up with uh, this COVID-19 uh, vaccine, right? So uh, that would, you know, that's going to change how the, the funds get allocated, right? Um, because now what happens is um, you, don't, you don't think, gee, how am I going to figure out how the, these people are going to give me the grant, right? What are they looking for? I'm thinking, okay, I got to come up with the solution. And I might spend a whole bunch of money and not get the prize, but... There will be people, what do you do? You're going to take the expected value, right? What's the probability that you can figure out the, pri or figure out the, 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 the vaccine or whatever uh, prior to anybody else, and you're going to get the prize? Um, but so we, the, I put an article in there on, on this discussion of offering prizes as a way to subsidize, for the government to subsidize, uh, subsidize pure research. Um, Second, you could rely on charity.
I was just looking at uh, the CBS NewsHour or something in the, well, uh, maybe Sunday morning or something. But anyway, uh, there was an interview. Chris Wallace was interviewing Bill Gates, right? And what's Bill Gates? The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is, he said he, they're going to spend up to a billion dollars um, in trying to Pro, to come up with it, to subsidize research into the vaccine and then distribution of the vaccine, particularly in uh, uh, lower income countries, right? So uh, clearly there are foundations that are out there the, that, uh, that are providing money to subsidize uh, some of the, the research and development. Uh, and so, um, uh, that may be, you know, a mechanism to do that. Uh, a third thing is what are called trade secrets protection. So you have and what happens here is, let's say you're working for American Electric Power, and you figure out, uh, you know, they're employing you to figure out this mechanism to, uh, to determine how the, uh, you, you can look at um, futures prices and spot prices, and you can figure out when's the best time to, uh, you know, buy and sell uh, power, or should you buy future prices, whatever. So they pay you, you come up with this thing, and then you get hired by some other electric company, okay? Normally what would happen is you would sign a non-disclosure agreement that says you're not going to, uh, you're, you're not going to disclose the secrets or dis uh, disclose the mechanism, you know, this, this, let's say this particular uh, uh, program, you're not going to disclose it to whoever hires you. And so you, these non-disclosure agreements are a mechanism to try to make it so that uh, intellectual property rights who owns it? Well, American Electric Power owns it because you got hired to do that. It's not your uh, program. Uh, but then, how do you enforce this? And it turns out that, um, you know, clearly we have laws for non disclosure agreements. Uh, the question is, how effective are they? Uh, and if you sort of think about it, it might be uh, hard to. Um, it might be hard to, uh, to enforce because if, because if, let's say uh, person B uh, steals from person A and then sells it to person C, person C, if they didn't know it was stolen, how could you, you know, what, you know, what, what would you have as a, as a uh, punishment for C from buying it from somebody when you, it was stolen by the other person, okay? So anyway, trade secrets protections are there uh, by having the, um, again, th the law allows for these non-disclosure agreements, but um, it, you have to think about whether uh, it's going to be uh, an effective. And then last thing that we're gonna talk more about now is the intellectual property rights. Right. Do we establish intellectual property rights? And so um, we, we're going to say, guess what? You own this intellectual property. You figured out how to uh, build a, uh, you know, build some machine, or you figure out maybe you figure out the machine itself, or uh, you know. So there's some sort of intellectual property that that by what does that do? It says, now I can sell that intellectual property, or if someone, uh, or if it's a, uh, uh, I'm a firm, I'm the only one that can, can do this, and so what do you do? Intellectual property allows for basically the creation of a monopoly, right? I mean, that's sort of what you're, what you're doing. I can't, I can't use your, uh, you know, once you've figured out the, how to build an airplane, right, I can't just go ahead and 
now I'm going to build an airplane. So you have this trade-off when you have intellectual property rights is that you have a uh, less distribution, which what you're really doing in intellectual property rights is you're creating a monopoly. Right? So if you're going to create a monopoly, what's the trade-off? One is you increase the incentive to innovate. Because if I spend all these resources inventing something, now I'm the only one that can have it, right? So normally in a market system, right, from Beacon 202, whatever, uh, what would happen? If you are producing this thing and you're earning economic profit, other firms are going to enter, right? And when the other firms enter, what's going to happen? If you, uh, uh, if, uh, so in the uh, absence of creating the monopoly, if you're earning economic profit, what do we say? We say firms enter. And what's that going to do? It's going to shift the supply curve for the industry off to the right, right? Because as more firms enter. So what would happen? Price would fall. Quantity would go up, right? And profit eventually equals zero, right? That was the whole idea of competitive markets. Well, um, if what I do is I establish this monopoly, then this part of it gets slowed down, right? The distribution of the product is, is going to be less than it otherwise would be. So you've got this trade off then, right? I've got a trade-off between if I grant intellectual property rights that say if you invent something, then you're going to be able to keep the monopoly over it, then you got more incentive to innovate. But I'm going to get less distribution than if I, uh, if I didn't allow for the monopoly. So there's this, this intellectual uh, property right, uh, th this trade-off in establishing what's the intellectual property right law going to look like. Now, if you are China and it's 1980, okay, you're not producing a whole lot of intellectual property, right? But you'd like to be able to copy it, right? If the Americans figure out how to, uh, you know, make a, uh, an electric car, okay, uh, you'd like to be able to go ahead and use that information and make electric cars yourself, okay? What happens is once China starts to become where they are, their economy gets sufficiently strong, right? And they get to the point where they're producing intellectual property. Well, they're going to want a stricter intellectual property law. Right? So that, notice that's, that's what's going on in China today, is that uh, uh, over the last 30 years, it's gone from, it's becoming more and more where they would like to have stronger intellectual property rights because they're actually producing electric, uh, intellectual property rather than being able to use the intellectual property of somebody, uh, of somebody else. All right, so one mechanism to do uh, intellectual property rights are uh, patents, patent law. And um, there are some uh, uh, articles in the folder that I just put in on, uh, on patent law uh, in there, and, and some have been there, but uh, I, I put a couple new ones in there. So anyway, under this section, uh, under property law, you might just take a look at some of these articles, particularly if what you're doing is you're developing your, um, your paper. Uh, you know, if you want to, if you decide, Geo might want to do something in patent law, uh, they'll give you some, uh, some, some background on that. Just historically, um, the first recorded patent uh, was in 1421. That was the first recorded patent, not the law, not the statute, but it was a patent that was granted, and it was in Florence. And it was granted uh, for the 
it was a it was a three year monopoly on the manufacture of a barge uh, that had hoisting gear that you could transport marble with. Right? So uh, so in Florence they uh, they they granted this uh, this three year monopoly uh, for this pr uh, production of this barge. The first statutes that are actually written, you know, a, a written statute uh, is 1474. Okay, so when we look at when did you start writing down in, in statutory law? Um, Written statute, uh, and it, that, again, the, the written statute is 1474. It's called the Venetian Statute. Just to give you an idea of how far back this goes. Um, England doesn't have written statutes until uh, 1623. Then they, it, it was called the uh, Statute of Monopolies in 1623. So just uh, our law um, is more uh, taken from the uh, British system than it is from the French system. But nonetheless, um, the point is, is that we've, we've had a history of writing these, uh, you know, writing out the law uh, dealing with uh, patents. Um, Article 1, Section 8 of your Constitution, where it describes the powers of Congress, uh, one, of the, the, one of the powers of Congress is to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Okay? So uh, when we wrote the Constitution, they, they recognized that there's a, you know, there is a uh, incentive to innovate that comes about from granting a monopoly, right? And so uh, again, Article One, Section Eight of the U.S. Constitution uh, is provides for the um, uh, provides for this. Now, um, to have a patent. If you sort of think of why, why do we want the patent? Why do we want to grant someone a monopoly? That's what really what we're doing, right? We're saying nobody else can use this thing. Um, and so uh, if, if we're uh, uh, writing a patent, then um, why would we want to do it? Because we want to encourage new stuff to happen, right? And, and so uh, uh, for a patent, it, it has to be uh, uh, non-obvious, right? If it's obvious, then the issue of the incentive, you know, or how much new innovation we're going to get, if it's pretty obvious, then why am I granting this monopoly and giving up the dispersion of the product, right? So the, uh, it, it's, got to, it's, it's got to be non-obvious. It has to have practical utility. So if you apply for a patent, the patent office is going to look at it and say, does this have any utility? If it doesn't have any practical utility, then why are we bothering with the thing? Right? Um, and it's, it's got to be non-commercialized uh, and uh, or known to the public for uh, more than a year before the date of the application. Okay? So it, it's uh, it, it not known or commercialized, commercialized for more than a year before you put your patent application in, right? So you can't just let this thing, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to grant a patent to something that's been out there for 15 years, okay? So uh, I'm gonna. It it has to be something that's in a sense new, new and useful, right? I mean that's really what we're uh, what we're really looking about. Um, now it turns out that 
you might decide not to grant a, not to apply for a patent. Okay? And why might that happen? You've got this clever idea. Um, you've got you know how to make this um, this machine, or you know how, or it's a process uh, on on doing things that's relatively new. Um, why would you not file? Well, one of the reasons is because when you file a patent, you got to tell people how it works. Okay, so when you file your patent, you, you file your patent, you're going to have told people. how it works, right? And so now what's happened is um, everybody's going to know how to do it. And then what, what, what could happen is that um, a the, uh, if, you're not, if you don't actually get the patent, right, if it's not actually granted to you, then all sorts of other people start using it, right? So you may decide, hey, or you might decide that once that patent's given, then I got to go out and if all sorts of other people start copying it because I've told you how to do it, and they'll start, then what do I do? I got to sue them, right? And then I got to figure out the expected, the expected value of that suit, okay? So you might decide, hey, nobody's going to figure this thing out if I don't tell them. And so I'm just as good not having the patent, not having told everybody uh, how it works. Um, and even if you are successful in getting the patent, then maybe, maybe somebody else is going to figure out how to do it slightly differently. Right? Be, so uh, if you sort of think about it, if you're successful in the patent, What might happen is others figure out a slightly different way. And that difference might be sufficient that they can get a patent on their process. The, you know, the patent office is going to decide how, how different this is. And so there's some, um, uh, it, you, it would not be unusual to find it where uh, people just don't file for a patent. Um, so uh, again, uh, there's, you, you have to alert people how this thing works. If you're going to file for a patent, maybe you're better off just uh, not doing it at all. Um, so. How long do you get to have a patent? Right? That's what's called the duration. And right? In the United States today, today in the US, it's 20 years. And generally that's the case uh, in the industrialized uh, world is that uh, the, the patents are uh, 20 years long, uh, 20 years. Uh, it used to be 17. In 1995, it switched to 20 because that's what some of the other countries are doing. Now, um, again, you might want to think through how long should a patent be, and we'll come back to that in just a second, but um, if, if it, you know, if it's something that, uh, costs a lot of money to figure out how to do it, then, and it's, and it's, but it's, it's highly valuable, then I might want to have a, a long duration so that you know you're going to have a monopoly over a long enough period of time that you're going to be able to recover what your expenses were, right? So, um, uh, you know, there's, again, you can sort of, it's, it's not, rocket surgery here, uh, you know, you can sort of think through, okay, uh, if it was something that was pretty 
you know, somebody was going to figure it out pretty quickly anyway, maybe I don't do it. Or if it's something that generates a whole lot of revenue in the short term, right, then I don't have to have as long a duration of, uh, for, the, for the patent. So uh, it's just a matter of sort of thinking, uh, thinking this thing through. Now, um, how broad, uh, um, how broad should a patent be? Right? That's, so those are the two issues. What's the duration, how long do you get it, and how broad is the patent? Um, when we're talking about the breadth of a patent, um, if I, I got, I'm going to have this sort of trade-off in a sense that I might have something that has, that's a, uh, an, an important uh, research and sort of R and, uh, research and development piece, but I haven't figured out a way to commercialize it, right? That is, do I want to make it so that if you commercialize, if the patent's really broad, then you, in order for you, you know, you figure out how to, you figure out a way to, to commercialize this thing, right? I've come up with this. Uh, uh, I've come up with this process, but I haven't really figured out a way how we're going to make a lot of money on this thing. And you guys figure out how to commercialize it. Well, do I need do I need to buy the use of the patent from you if I'm figuring out how to commercialize it, right? Or do you just make the patent uh, relatively narrow in that, yeah, you've got a, you've got a patent over this, uh, this methodology, but somebody else has figured out the way to commercialize a thing. So if I make the, the patent uh, broad in the sense that if, you, uh, if you're going com if you're going to commercialize this, you need to get uh, permission from me because I own this broad patent that I'll, uh, that you, you have to get the patent or use of the patent from me in order to commercialize it. Then what's going to happen is I have a more incentive for research and development. Okay, I'm going to be coming up, I'm going to spend more uh, or we'll have more incentive to do basic research and development. I, I don't care how you commercialize this thing, right? I don't even know if you can commercialize it, but it's a really cool thing, right? It's a, it's a really cool process or whatever, okay? So if I make it, if I make it broad, uh, then, then what will happen is you get more incentive for, for, for research, right? If I make it narrow, then you have more incentive to figure out a way to commercialize it. So there's the, again, there's this trade-off. What's this? Opportunity cost here, right? There's, just, there's a trade-off. Whenever you're making the law, you're going you're gonna to establish this trade-off. And so the, the uh, basic research and development um, can yield ideas that it's difficult to, uh, that it can uh, yield ideas that somebody else got to figure out how to commercialize the thing and how, how important is the commercialization or how important is the basic research and development that will determine how broad that the, the uh, patent would be. So, um, notice that I could, uh, you allow for the buying and selling of patents, right? Um, let's say what I could do is if you had a, let's say you had a broad patent, that in order to, for me to commercialize whatever this other person's discovered, 
I got to have their patent. If you allow for the sale of patents, or for the holder of the patent to grant you use, right? So you pay somebody in order to be able to, uh, to, to use this, uh, this basic idea they've got, okay? So again, if you sort of think through that, um, it's going to, um, it's going to depend on bargaining costs, right? I mean, we keep coming back to the Cosian solution or the Obsian solution, right? If, if, there's, if, there's, uh, if there's no transactions costs, um, then uh, it's not too important to get the breadth of the patent right, right? Because the, the person that's going to commercialize will just buy it. Right? Uh, and, and, the, and the patent will move to the person who values it the most. So if you have low transactions costs, just at, and, and, and what are we really saying? We're just reinforcing the idea that it, giving the property right to the right person doesn't matter too much, right? That's what Coase is saying. I, as long as I grant property rights, as long as I write the law, so I've granted the property rights. If there's little transactions costs, don't have to worry about it, right? Because the parties will bargain. It will matter for the distribution of income, but it's not going to matter for does the property right go to the person that has the, the highest value. So if you have low transactions costs, then you can use then you have coats, right? Um, you, you don't need to know the proper breadth, right? Or you have less need to know what the proper breadth is because people will buy it back and back and forth. But if you have Hobbes, um, where there's high transactions costs, Right, the, what they call you know the normative normative Hobbes. Um, so you have high transactions costs. Then you have to you, then you have to know um, which party values it more. That is is the research and development more valuable than the commercialization, right? So now I got to know research and development or commercialization more valuable. So if I want to encourage commercialization of things, then I'm going to make narrow patents. If I uh, want to encourage research and development, I'm going to have broader patents. Uh, and what, what is that breadth of that particular patent? Um, that really sort of depends on, um, on whether we can figure this thing out or not. Um, one of the things that you might think about is antitrust law might re antitrust law uh, could impede bargaining. That is, can, uh, you know, could uh, Dell and Microsoft get together uh, on some sort of sharing the, they're going to share the research and development and commercialization of uh, some computer programming, okay? So, uh, ag again, when you're we're just sort of thinking through what the law should look like, uh, some of the things that you have to worry about is this, um, what are the transactions costs, and that will uh, uh, affect. Um, 
There's a thing called a doctrine of equivalence. And equivalence, E N C E. Um, there's a thing called the doctrine of, a, uh, of equivalence, and it says, um, is this is what you have when you file for your patent, is that pretty much equivalent to something that's already out there? There's, in the, in the patent office, there, anybody know how many patents are applied for? About, about in 2019, about 670,000. Okay, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of patent applications coming in, people trying to figure this, this out, right? But, so, there, there are employees that are, you know, in the bureaucracy, what are they trying to do? They're trying to figure out, this is, hey, does this thing look pretty much um, equivalent uh, to another patent, or um, is this, uh, uh, is it something um, uh, sufficiently different? And so, is an improvement on something uh, which was not uh, commercially viable, okay? And, then you got to sort of think through um, what happens when you sue somebody, right? You, you, you sue somebody uh, and for a patent infringement. And when you do that, you can, if, again, if we were thinking about uh, what happens when you have a violation, if I have a violation, you know, I sue them, and what could I have? I could have where I get an injunction, says, hey, you can't use this anymore, or compensation, or both, right? When I go to sue you because I think that you've infringed on my patent, I could get an injunction that says, hey, you can't produce this stuff anymore. I could also say, hey, not only can you not produce this stuff anymore, you gotta compensate me and here's the, Here's what it cost me for you to be infringing my patent, uh, and so the you know the the courts uh, the courts have to decide that. So when I'm looking at when, if I'm the, uh, the the court, I'm trying to decide how close is this thing to to the to the patented thing, and so the you know the the, the question is is this this is this um, is it a um, and again, if we're talking about the breadth, um, if something is a, uh, an improvement uh, which now results in the thing being commercially viable, okay, how, how, how do you want to deal with that? How do you want to set the law up to say, okay, um, this is, this is, a, this is a, a little bit different because, and now is commercially viable? And the other, I, the other thing wasn't commercially viable. Is this, is this sufficiently a, uh, a sufficient difference uh, to make it so that uh, it's now commercially viable? Um, there's a, um, there's essentially, and I'll just run through this here for a second, but uh, um, it does, the, what they look at, does it perform the same function in the same way with the same result, right? When I'm, when, I'm, when I'm trying to look through and decide if this is equivalent, is this a, something that either shouldn't be granted a patent or is this something that's in violation uh, of a patent? Uh, and uh, so the, the idea is, uh, uh, does it um, perform the same function in the same way with the same result. Same function, same way, and the same result. If it does, then it's either, in an, if it was something where you're being sued for infringing on the patent, then, uh, then the, the person that's suing you would be successful. Um, or if you were applying for a patent, 
uh, and they're looking at it and say, well, you know, there's this other thing out there that is, is the same thing, so I'm not going to, I'm not, not going to grant a patent for that. Um, in fact, uh, there's a, um, basically this last thing came from a, a 1950s, uh, a 1950 case called uh, Grover Tank and uh, Lindy Air Products. So uh, uh, the Supreme Court is basically, courts have sort of led us to, this is how we're gonna decide whether this is an infringement or not. All right, so for Wednesday, we will be talking about uh, the duration uh, of, uh, of the patent, and we'll be, and we'll be moving on, th uh, Moving, just basically moving on through chapter five, uh, working our way through uh, chapter five, and we'll see how far we can get into chapter five before the, before the midterm, All right? I'm, I'm thinking I may put the last two, you know, for those who had Ecamm 105, I put a, a bunch of the old exams on the server. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking whether I'll do that or not. I might put the last two, uh, lawn economics exams on there so you have an idea what it what they look like all right